So apologies for the very generic uh, title. Um, um, as you'll see, uh, much of what I'm going to speak to you uh, today about is, about is focused on radio astronomy, and we're hoping that there are people also in the GNU radio and SDR community that are interested in working with us. Um, I'm here in kind of with two hats. I work for the University of Cambridge in the UK, but I also have a company through which I have developed some of this work, so uh, that's why it's there. Um, and I mostly work with Jack Hickish. Some of you in the room may know him. Um, the division of work is pretty much me more on the hardware end than him on the software end. So, um, so the, the the main purpose of this is really to change the way uh, the you know the change the model that's used for uh, low frequency radio astronomy in terms of digitization architectures and that's what I'm going to be focusing on uh, especially the common problems with the with this approach um, the real focus of this is to try to develop something that can just digitize at the antenna and can synchronize and and works uh, works really well without all this extra infrastructure that's needed and that's how the Sparrow project was born um, I can tell you Sparrow doesn't actually stand for anything. Um, I, I made the decision not to make acronyms uh, for this project, so it's just, it's just the name of a bird. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to talk about the current status of the project and hopefully future fun that we're going to have. Um, so in terms of astronomy, especially low-frequency astronomy, um, there are numerous experiments being done now uh, where these are really array experiments, so phased array, large arrays of antennas that are, you know, essentially the output is the correlation matrix, so you're correlating all the antennas, uh, every antenna with every other one. Um, really, for astronomy, these are cheap antennas, there are lots of them, and the bandwidth that we're looking at is orders of, you know, hundreds of megahertz, so it's not a huge amount of bandwidth, and so as a result of that, we don't actually need a high level of station processing uh, per antenna. And so traditionally, it's been easy to just funnel everything into a single FPGA, so take as many RF channels as we can get away with, push it into a single FPGA, um, and, um, and you know, uh, save on cost by, by doing that. So um, this is a project that Jack and I both worked on. Um, it's um, a leading cosmology experiment at the moment um, uh, called HERA, Hydrogen Epoch of Reionization Array. This is the architecture of the system. So there's a front end, uh, 350 meter, uh, sorry, 350 uh, 40 meter dishes, and they have feeds in them. There is RF over fiber that carries the analog signaling. Um, and then we have, we use these. Uh, snap boards, which are basically FPJ boards that do the channelization step and then basically output 10 gig and further down the line we do the correlation step. Um, as you can see, there's lots of kind of blocks in this system and lots of places where data is funneled to, 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 the next, uh, to the next container. Um, so why have we opted for this many antennas per board architecture? Well, the obvious one is that it reduces um, the clock distribution, right? Because, um, you know, if you have, you can basically share resources. So if you can get, you know, three or six or 12 antennas into a single board, then you can basically um, uh, share those resources and, and, and reduce the cost. Um, it's supposed to be also, of course, cost effective. Um, this is just some examples to show you the cost per channel um, for these platforms. So SNAP is one. Um, so most of these have been, apart from ITPM actually, been developed by the Casper community. But SNAP is one that's been used for HERA. So it basically does six times 500 mega sample. Um, and ITPM is a board that's been developed for the Square Kilometer Array project, which is supposed to be a, another project that I'm very much involved in, it's supposed to be the sort of big uh, big radio astronomy uh, project um, that's, that's going to be deployed soon. Um, and this is just some idea of the channel cost that you get uh, cost per channel. So you can see that it's reasonably low. 
of course, one can argue, well, what is a channel? Um, how much bandwidth are we getting? It's a few hundred megahertz, and it's typically at a bit depth of, you know, 8 to eight to 12 or so. Um, the common problems with this architecture is that it often requires some kind of no scenario and analog signaling. Uh, a lot of these systems require some control up front. So for Hera, for example, we have lots of sensors in the feed. We have phase switching. We have GPIO that's needed to you know, uh, switch on attenuation and things like that. And so um, all of this has to be kind of fed back from the uh, back uh, the, the, the processing platform. Um, there's lots of connection points between the antenna and the final output signal. Um, and more importantly, in terms of the science, uh, analog artifacts really have an impact on the, on the science because of, you know, cable reflections. Um, so... Uh, you know, if you've got a coaxial cable connection or even an RF05 connection, despite the fact that the uh, reflection coefficient is reasonably good, you, you know, when you get down to levels of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6, uh, integrating for some period of time, you do see those things and they do impact your, the sensitivity of your instrument. So, and of course, crosstalk between channels is, is an issue as well. Um, why would you not want to you know, digitize at the antenna. Well, traditionally, you know, um, people would say, you know, self-generated RFI is a big issue. These are very sensitive instruments. You know, do we really want switching electronics and clocks to be right next to your very sensitive receiver? Uh, clock distribution is, is, is a big one. You know, we want clock distribution to hundreds, maybe a thousand antennas over long distances. And, um, and of course, cost effectiveness. You know, can we ever get cost parity between uh, a single, say, dual channel board versus some of these boards that can deal with much, m many more channels. Um, and to some extent, some of these problems are, are solved. Um, uh, so in terms of self-generated RFI, um, switching electronics power is, is a big one. Um, so there are some modern uh, chips by analog devices, silent switcher range that we're actually uh, using for Sparrow. Um, and these have really low uh, conducted and radiated MI performance. So we're hoping that this is going to improve that, um, that um, self-generated RFI issue. And of course, with good RFI shielding practice, you can also uh, improve, uh, improve this. In terms of timing distribution, well, of course, we have White Rabbit. It's open source. It's capable of synchronizing circa 1,000 nodes. It can work over many, many kilometers, and it's readily available. You can go to, uh, there's a bunch of companies that you can buy from, and they're not particularly expensive. Um, and in terms of like implementing this on your platform, um, the cost is almost zero. I mean, the extra components that you need to actually implement this is really very, very little. Uh, you know, a couple of extra clocks and, a, and um, some control. Um, so, um, in terms of cost and deployment, the thing for us was, you know, um, doing a little search. There are a bunch of FPGAs, sort of smallish FPGAs and system or modules that can do 10 gig. That would be quite appropriate for a reasonable amount of processing. That would be kind of good. But um, also, um, in terms of the architecture, of course, if we can just have a board that plugs into an antenna and you have synchronized data coming out, then you save on signal transport. You, um, you know, control signaling, and hopefully you can build things that are low power. Um, and so increased modularity reduces complexity. Um, I don't want to say we're pretty cheap in astronomy, but um, particularly these low frequency instruments, you know, there is obviously, uh, you know, you've got lots of antennas, and so you really want to keep the cost down. Um, and so I said, you know, what are the other available low-cost options? Um, of course, if you go to uh, some of the military spec, you know, uh, suppliers, you can get probably exactly what you need, but uh, maybe at a price mark that is outside the range for astronomy. Um, and so for us, you know, at the very cheap end, you have Red Pattaya. Red Pattaya is great, but it's, you know, uh, sampling is a little bit too... Too low for uh, too slow for astronomy, no high speed output, and there's basically no built in time in recovery. Um, and then slightly at the upper end, you have the RF SOC 4x2 board, which is 
very, very cheap, and that's because Xilinx are basically giving the chips for free for this for this application. Um, it's the you have to be part of the Xilinx uh, University program at this price, and perhaps for some of these low frequency applications, is a little bit overkill. So Jack and I kind of scratching our heads and having a bit of time to spare over the pandemic thought, why not you know try to design something that actually addressed some of these points and might be useful to a bunch of other people. Um, so conceptually, the system diagram is fairly simple. It's got a couple of inputs. You can have additional analog um, uh, signal conditioning. There's an ADC, double, dual channel ADC, that can um, you know, sample up to 900 mega samples, so basically getting up to 400 megahertz of bandwidth. Um, an FPGA and 10 gig outputs. Um, plus, we want to have timing recovery that can rely on white wrap. Um, there is a transmit option as well, and I'll go into that in a, in a moment, TX option. Um, so, um, yeah, so these, these were the kind of requirements. You know, it has to have white rabbit incorporated, can still use traditional PPS and 10 megs reference inputs. Reasonable bandwidth of a few hundred megahertz, something from 200 to 400 megahertz of bandwidth. Um, we can use a range of ADCs actually produced by TI that, that can do that. Um, and we can get 40 gig output or three times 10 gig output plus White Rabbit. Um, fairly small form factor. We really wanted a tiny board that can just plug into an antenna. And it's using, at the moment, this class of uh, seven series Xilinx zinc chips. Um, and then we wanted the potential to like add a mezzanine card or daughter board that added additional functionality like a, a DAC. So um, I went away for a little while and I um, uh, did a design for this board. Um, and that's the CAD drawing of what it looks like. Um, so, you know, incorporating silent switcher, power, some RAM, flash, the ADC. Uh, the zinc and a bunch of other useful things that you would want, like um, Ethernet, USB, SD card, reference input, reference outputs, um, white rabbit circuitry, and um, a bunch of GPIO pins. So actually, uh, yeah, we've got a connector. That's a um, GPIO, SBI, I squared C um, produces a bunch of IOs on that. Um, plus, there's this 60-pin high-speed mezzanine connector that allows us to get a reasonably high-speed DAC or dual-channel DAC into, um, you know, plug into that board so that we get not just receive, but also uh, not just RX, but uh, TX functionality. Um, first prototype was produced um, a little uh, time after that, and this is what it looks like, and um, it looks kind of similar to the CAD drawing. Um, and then I kind of passed things over to Jack, who went away and did a lot of good work um, uh, so there's, you know, did some Simulink integration, developed the yellow blocks for the ADC and the 10 gig, it has a Linux image, and it's running TCP ball server. The ADC interface, interface and um, channel synchronization has been tested quite well. And there's white rabbit locking, so those screens, the black screens you see, which are, don't look very exciting, actually are tests that show the white rabbit system is working. Um, and of course, 10 gig support. Um, in terms of the software pipeline, um, we um, and this is the relate, you know, how this is related to GNU Radio. Up to this point, I've just been talking about a random platform that maybe is of no interest to anyone. Um, but the idea is that you know, hopefully, we're moving towards something that really we don't want to do too much processing on the platform. We want to output synchronized ADC packets that come out of the antenna um, or out of whatever system you have and probably need little or no processing. I mean, the stuff that I've been talking about, if you want to build a channelizer that does 1,000 or 2,000 or 4,000 channels is, you know, can be done. But if you want to kind of get much more than that, then there might be limits in terms of what you can get away with on the FPGA fabric. Um, for astronomy, this is really advantageous because you can do this like FX design, you know, um, frequency transform, co cross correlation, and you can use basically just send the fiber back to the backend, and you can you know use FPGA and GPU racks to do 
most of that, and not to make that stuff sound uh, easy, because it's not, but you know, there's lots of hardware uh, off the shelf available and lots of code that people have developed that does that work. It's much easier to turn ADC packets, write software to you know, produce a really high resolution spectrometer um, than doing it in firmware. And really the aim for us now is to see if we can develop, um, you know, make this compatible with the GNU radio backend um, so that we can really significantly reduce the time it takes for users to get up and running and, and use this platform. So the short-term roadmap is we want to enhance the Sparrow design to incorporate full transceiver design. As I said at the moment, it's just a baseband receiver, but we're looking to add that uh, TX functionality in, uh, provide frequency extension through a daughter board that gets us up to uh, several gigahertz, and fine-tune some firmware, and hopefully develop the GNU radio backend. Um, we both believe in open source stuff, so um, you know the plan is that whatever mezzanine cards and stuff that we're developing, we will just make those KiCad six files available to people. So whether it be the down converter or IQ data or the DAC functionality, and if people want to, yeah, kind of design their own, they can use that as a as a um, as a template. Um, What's next? We're gonna, um, we've just made one prototype. We're gonna make Ref2. There were some minor changes that we needed to make. Primarily the synthesizer part that I used has gone um, into end of life, which I should have known better. Um, so, you know, we've, I've designed it with a, with a different one and we're looking for people that wanna play around with this board. Um, and finally, um, looking forward, there are other projects that Jack and I are involved in at L Band, where we're looking at kind of the big brother of this and sticking to bird names. The next one up, maybe Hawk, um, which might be the big brother of this. So for that, we're looking at a pretty beefy, um, uh, you know, ultra scale um, SOM. So this is a SOM developed by iWave ZU11, uh, pretty beefy processor, 100 gig output. And we're looking at the AD9207, which is dual channel six giga sample per second. So ideally for that project, we're looking at something like two to, giga, two to three gigahertz of real-time bandwidth. Um, of course, there's a version of these chips that's um, mixed signal, so TX and RX, and that would be ideal um, to develop something based around that. And of course, again, incorporating White Rabbit. Um, so yeah, um, the... The details are in the presentation. If anybody has any interest, then I'll be around, um, you know, looking for people to learn from and work with. So, yeah, feel free to 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 approach us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a fair bit of time for questions. So, who has a question to, for the speaker? I'm sorry, I may have missed this, but do you have a, an estimated price on the um, um, Sparrow? So yeah, at the, we're, we're trying to get something that's kind of not too far off that RF soft price. So something of order 2K, maybe 2.5K in lowish volumes. But yeah, that's kind of the, the kind of price uh, that we're aiming for. All right. Oh. Another question, and um, you can let me know if there are any questions online. Uh, th thanks for the talk. Um, at some point, you mentioned an FX engine on the on the on the FPGA, an FX and an FXF. Um, 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 yeah. So the 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 frequency step and the cross correlation step. Um, so I was just saying, like, in terms of what people want to do with the radio astronomy instrument, often they're doing correlation, so they'll do channelization and then they'll cross multiply every channel. So the F engine does the Fourier transform and the X engine does the cross multiply. But we're really not, so the idea for this is just to output ADC packets and you do all of that off, you know, at the, at the other end. Oh, okay, okay, I see. Because 
because uh, once you need to cross correlate, you have to aggregate all the antennas together um, onto the same on, on the same system to do the to do your cross correlation. So you can do what like Hera is doing, for example, where you do the F engine. You have a coarse channelizer up front, right? So you do whatever thousands of channels, and then you can do the X step and another, you know, and then do another layer of kind of finer channels if you like. But that's all downstream. Okay. And is there any target um, instrument for um, for Sparrow and for Hawk? Um, any, sorry? A t target instrument, a target radio telescope. Um, to the, uh, the, so there's one instrument um, talking to a um, uh, uh, professor from Harvard about, but we've had, uh, so Jack gave this kind of presentation at the Casper workshop, and there's a bunch of people that are interested. But as I said, it was kind of born out of a little bit of boredom over the uh, pandemic and wanting to do something fun. Um, but yeah, cool stuff. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And, uh, we have another question. I just need to walk, uh, walk over. We have a bunch of questions because I'm reading out all the questions from the internet. Here. So um, you already talked about the cost. Ralph Steinhagen um, is asking if you would consider making a public or crowdsourced production run. Uh, sorry, I didn't. Could you repeat that? A public, a crowdsourced production run. Build a bunch of these, sell them, get, you know, get get crowd crowdsourced. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, we, we have considered that because at the moment this is kind of self-funded, <laughs> um, and mostly funded by Jack. To be fair, although I've thrown a bit of my money in as well, but yeah, um, definitely, I think that's of interest. Um, haven't. I guess we wanted to make the first prototype and make something that worked, and it seemed to work. So now, yeah, we're looking at the next step. OK. Uh, next question uh, from Daniel Estevez. Um, uh, how will the network streaming protocol for Sparrow look like? Will it be similar to the SNAPs? If so, have you looked at the radio blocks that Mike Piscopo did for the SNAPs, and maybe it's helpful to reuse part of this? Did you? I, I, think, I think that's, um, yeah, I think that probably is compatible, but it's something that I would probably want to relate to Jack because um, he got it more involved on that end. Okay, and then I'll just have a follow on to that. So how did you do the, um, you know, you showed some streaming pictures, like so, so how did you implement that? Did you just send raw data over the ethernet link and capture that on the? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay.